What a privilege. I know it is difficult. Some people have different conditions and they are, uh, some of them elderly, uh, they cannot come, but they hopefully watch on the internet. But what a privilege to be back in the church. We uh, sometimes don't know what we have before we lose it. In Romania, when we had some communism and some hardship, people appreciated church. It seems sometimes we appreciate some things more when we lose them. You know what I'm trying to say? But uh, my point is not we didn't lose our churches yet. They are not closed yet. But the spirit of prophecy says that there are agencies working together to restrict religious freedom. Before Jesus comes, there will be a Sunday law. And she talks about all those events. Those events are not in the far future. Those events are very close to happen. In fact, about two years ago in Russia, they passed a law that nobody can invite anybody for evangelism, you will be arrested. Nobody can send a flyer. Nobody can knock in your door to give you a book. Nobody. And right now, some of the evangelicals asked our government to do the same. They also are fighting for a Sunday law. And they say for blue color law, so people have peace on Sunday, no more noise, so they could rest. But things will come sooner than we think. The Bible will be fulfilled. My subject is not right now. We talked at 10 o'clock about second coming events. We just touched on them. I have two series of sermons on second coming, seven of them talking to the parables related to the second coming, and seven of them related to preparation, how to prepare. And there I give a chart of the events in chronological order following the Bible and spirit of prophecy. We don't do that now. Right now, we are going to talk about commitment, surrender. How do you surrender? Last night, if you remember, I did mention that Ellen White says that surrender is when you daily depend on God, make yourself available for God's plans. When you don't follow your plans, but God's plans. And she says that God desires, a very interesting quotation, that God desires to actually talk to us and to tell us his plans. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. In Desire of Ages, page 363, everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God for their daily life. Everyone needs to obtain a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to our heart daily. That's in the spirit of prophecy. Well, <clears throat> let me start uh, our presentation. The scripture reading was, and uh, we can actually start, I don't know, with this Bible verse. Actually, the next one, the scripture reading was this. If anyone comes after me and doesn't hate mother and father and the easiest one, mother-in-law and brother and sister and son and daughter and husband and wife and himself is not worthy to be my disciple. Okay? The word hate that is in italics there, in Greek is misheo, is not translated to hate. It's translated that the love for that compared to the love for God, looks like hate. You love God so much that the love for self or for job or for mother or for father or for children or for spouse, the love for them compared to the love for Christ looks like hate. You need to love God more than. Another translation from Greek says to love less than. Basically, to love your mother or father or whatever, less than you love God. Jesus doesn't teach you to hate somebody because he told us to love people just as we love ourselves. Jesus, in fact, on the cross told John to take care of his mother. Jesus tells us in the fifth commandment to love our parents and to honor them. He doesn't say that we should hate one another. He says that our love for them compared to our love for God should be like hate. We should love God with all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, all our being, with no reservation. No reservation whatsoever. Well, let me give you a story as we start. Before I give you the story, I'm going to ask you a question. Does God have power? Yes. It's simple. Why do you keep quiet? Everybody say, yeah. Okay. 
So God has power. How much power? Infinite. You know what infinite means? You cannot because it's infinite. If you knew, then it would be finite. You know, it would be limited. It's infinite. It's unlimited. It doesn't end. Unlimited power. Extreme power. Beyond human comprehension. Power. Does God change? No. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the Bible says. Okay. If God doesn't change, where is the power that the previous church experienced? Where is the power that split the sea? Imagine if you are there and you walk through the sea. Imagine you go to the sea and the, the sea splits and you walk actually between two walls of water and you stick your hand into the water to touch a fish and then take it back and the water stays horizontal, I mean vertically. Can you grasp that? Where is that power? The sun moved back 10 hours. Can you imagine the gravitation, the gravity, the universe, the, all that science, that physics, all... Pff, what happened to it? Imagine Jericho walls coming down. However, the part of the wall with Rahab standing up. How do you explain that? I could go on and on and on. Lazarus resurrected. And he was, the Bible says, smelling hard because he was dead for several days. Imagine that. Where is that power? Either God is in vacation. He went to the glacier and he, he's missing. Or God lost his power or he just doesn't care anymore. Or there is nothing wrong with God. You know why says the promises are not shorter on God's side. But it is the church today. There is something wrong with us. And so, let me give you a story before we start. An introduction to the sermon. When I was in college, in that time in Romania, it was kind of difficult to get in college. It was not that you register, you pay the tuition fee, and you are in. No, you had to go to some exams. And I had, uh, in the first day, I had mathematics for several hours. I had an exam on trigonometry, one on geometry, one on algebra, and one on calculus. Second day, I had exam in physics. I had mechanic physics, static physics, electronic physics, anyway, four exams in physics. Next day, I had an exam in languages, and it was uh, composition, and it was this, and it was that, and it, you know. And after three days of exams, you didn't know if you are in, because it was a limited number of seats. They call them seats, openings. For instance, when my sister went to the music conservatory in Bucharest, there were 2,000 students competing for two openings. When I went to Construction University in Tei, that was the name of the street, the name of the neighborhood. When I went to Construction University, there were several. It was civil constructions, it was bridges and, and uh, roads, it was uh, hydraulic and hydro hydrotechnic powerhouses, construction, and it was different buildings, different fac fac uh, universities, I mean different schools. I went to the hydraulics and hydrotechnics. When I went there, there were 976 students competing for 10 openings. Basically, it didn't matter if you got a, a, a 3.98. If there were 10 students that got a 3.99, they were in. You are supposed to be among top 10 to be in because there were only 10 openings. If you're the 11th one, you are out. By God's grace, I got in the fourth one. And I called my dad. I, was, I went to the, uh, a week later to see if I was in or out. And my friend Pizzi, there were list after list after list after list on the window with names. Fail, 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 in. Fail, 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 fail. Hundreds, fail, fail, fail. And my friend Pizzi saw me right away. And he put his hand like he was leaning against the window. And I look and I don't find myself in or out. And I read the list again. He was covering my name with his palm. And I read the list again. I say, these people lost me. Uh, he took his hand. He says, you are in. I call my dad. Hey, man, I am in. I'm happy. I, I am in. I'm going to have a good job, a good salary, a good life. I'm happy. And he's quiet. I said, aren't you happy? He says, for what? Don't you hear me? I got accepted. I am the fourth one among 976 students. I am in. He says, I, this is what are you happy for? I said, yes. I said, Son, what's wrong with you? I was ready to say, Dad, what's wrong with you? But I was polite. I said, Dad, I am in. And he said to me, Son, you should call me to tell me that you are happy when you have a close connection with Jesus, not that you got a better life. 
I said, well, yes, I do have a close connection with Jesus. He said, you never call me to tell me that, to say, I am in. You call me to tell me when you get a better job or a better salary. You never call me to tell me that you have a better life with Jesus. I said, well, that's you understand. I don't need to be so excited about it. You follow me? And my father said, what would help you to get a better salary if you lose your salvation? I said, well, they don't compete. I can have both. He says, yes, you, could, you can. Which one comes first? I said, Jesus. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. I love Jesus with all my heart. He said, it's easy to think so. And then he said to me, the lost coin thought he was in? Because he was lost in the house. Can you be in the house and be lost? Can you be in the church and be lost? And not know that you are lost because you are in the church? It says there in Revelation 13 that all will worship all. How many? All who dwell on earth will worship the beast. How many? All. Well, the key word is who dwell on earth. And in the Greek translation, that word is to focus on to live in. All who focus on earthly things worship the beast. Can you be in the church, think that you worship God, and focus on earthly things, and without knowing, worship the beast? Ah. Oh, we go to church, we sing kumbaya, we must be saved. If you go to church, and your stress, it's all about this world, you are worshiping the beast. Unless your stress, it's about worshiping God. You have another God. And so my father said to me, if you are so happy that you got a better salary, you are actually worshiping salary. I said, no, dad, I love Jesus all my heart. He says, that's what you think, son, but you don't know that you are sick. He said, you need to put your thermometer. I said, what? Spiritual thermometer. I said, what's that? Well, see whatever comes before God, and that will tell you who you worship. I said, ah, that's what you think. I worship God. Two months later, they call me at the dean office, the rector. And he says, Goya. I said, yes. You are a good student, straight A's. It was, it was number. It was one to ten. It was not A's. You have straight tens. I said, yeah. I was proud of it, you know. Among top two in the whole school, you know. Don't touch me. I am holy. And he says, Goya, you have a problem. Okay. You don't come Saturdays to school. We had in that time school on Saturdays. I said, yeah, I don't come to school because I go to church. We know that. And we will expel you from the school. I said, what? That's the end of your education. If you would go camping as some crazy students do, we'll forgive you. If you are sick, we'll forgive you. But if you go to church in this country, you cannot. We'll expel you from the school. Guess what I did? Like every good Adventist, I prayed. Lord, please save my education, my future, my salary. Please, please, please save my school. Please, Lord, please. And I prayed desperate. And then I even fasted for four hours. I never fast more than four hours because I get hungry. And I, nothing happened. Then I had faith, strong faith. Lord, I believe that you answer. Because if you believe God answers, he has no choice. Poor God, you know. If you believe, he has to do it. That's what we do. We use faith to manipulate God. If you believe, God has to do it. Faith is not to change God's mind. Faith is that you accept his will. When you don't understand what is going on, you decide to trust in him. That's faith. Faith is not that if you believe, he does what you want. Faith is that you believe you do what he wants. So I had strong faith and nothing happened. And after I prayed two days and two nights, uncounted prayers, I had no relief. Did it ever happen to you that you go to prayer and you struggle and you leave prayer and you still struggle? So I called my dad. I'm in trouble. He says, what did you do? You had an accident with your motorcycle. I said, no. He said, what did you do? I said, they expel me from school for Sabbath. What shall I do? He says, son, that's not a question to ask. I said, why not? He says, okay, let me ask you another question. Do you love Jesus? I asked you two months ago. I said, yes. Okay, question answered. Bye. I call him back. I, why do you hang up on me? He said, but I gave you your answer. I said, I'm losing school, and I've been praying, and God doesn't answer. What shall I do? He says, what do you want me to say? Go to school on Sabbath? 
Stay home? That's your decision, son. I said, yeah, but I am praying and God doesn't answer. And my father says, son, let me ask you again. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you really love Jesus with all your heart? Yes. More than anything? Yes. More than school? Yes. Okay, you got your answer. Bye. Oh, man, I called him back. I said, you don't answer the question. I'm losing school. He says, son, do you love Jesus more than school? Yes. Then why do you call me? Because I'm losing school and I'm praying. And he doesn't answer the prayer. He says, you, wrong, you pray the wrong prayer. How do I pray the wrong prayer? Shouldn't I pray for my education? He says, oh, yes. Education and for your trouble and for your needs, we should cast all our needs upon him. But it's not okay to put education over God. It's not okay to put job over God. It's not okay to put anything, yourself, your mother, your father, yourself, your health, your life, is not okay to put it before God. God needs to come first. Whatever you put before God, that's what you worship. That's your God. Whatever stresses you, that's your God. You should be stressed of your relationship with God. Nothing else. And my father said to me, if you seek me first and my kingdom, and when he says seek first the kingdom of God, doesn't refer to, see, to seek eternal life. In Greek, it's to seek the prosperity of the kingdom. If you seek first the interests of God's kingdom, if you seek first the righteousness, if you seek first your relationship with God, God promises and God doesn't lie that the other things, all of them will be provided above and beyond what you imagine or pray. And my father said, people struggle because they seek first other things. When you learn to seek God first, you'll stop struggling. And he read me a quotation that I do have in this presentation. And she says, we stress because we seek other things. When we start seeking God, our stress is going to diminish. You follow me? And my father said to me, you pray the wrong prayer. I said, what do you mean? He says, this is the way you should pray. Lord, I would love to be in school. But it's not about me. I am not the center of the universe. You are. If my presence in school would serve you and help those communist people to know that there is a God in heaven, let me be in school. But if my presence is not going to serve you, why would I want to be in school? If my life would serve you, let me live. If not, why would I want to live for myself? So if I don't serve you in school, get me out of that school and put me wherever you think that I would serve you. I said, Dad, I cannot pray that prayer because I want to be in school. And he said, good luck then with your life. And then he said to me, are you sure that you are going to use this job? Are you sure that you are going to live to enjoy the salary? Are you sure that you are going to be saved? And he said, I will pray for you, son. You have the wrong perspective. So I prayed the prayer my father told me. I said, Lord... I would love to be in school, but if you want me to be expelled, please don't expel me, but may your will be done. <laughs> and if I am in school, help me to be a light and help those communist people to know that God does exist. And help me to be a light and help them have a chance to salvation. And use me in school to represent you. And use me in school as a light. If not, kick me out. And after I prayed that prayer, again I had peace. After two days and two nights. And I went to school Thursday morning, and Mrs. Radu, the school secretary, said to me, Goya, please come. You are a straight-A student. It would be a pity to lose school. Please come. Listen, you come to school, and you can be here, and in your mind pray. It's a nice compromise, and you get both. God ends education. I said to her, I said, listen, if God wants to save my education, he will do it. If not, I don't need it. There were three young men, and they didn't worship the image. And they didn't compromise to bow down to tight their shoelaces, you know. They stood straight. They had a backbone. And they said to the king, if God wants to save us, he will save us from the fire. Because the Bible says, when you walk through the fire, I will be with you. You are never alone. But if not, we would rather die. And we put God first before school. And before job. And before life. And we put God first before anything else. Because God comes first. And I told her. I'm going to put God first. And she said to me. You are extremist. You Christians are crazy. There is no God. Have you seen God? I said yes. She said I told you you are crazy. 
And she said to me, there is no God to save you from a communist government. Nobody can save you. And she said, you'll be expelled this Saturday. You are out. And I said, lady, there is a God who can save me. And she said, not against the country law. I said, yes, my God is bigger than the country law or the country government or the country police or the country communism. I don't care. My God is bigger. She said, you are crazy. That was Thursday. She said, I want to see what God can help you. I called my father. I made the decision. I prayed the way you said. And this is what the lady said. And my father said, she's in trouble. I said, what do you mean? She said, what God? I want to see what God can save you. She challenged God. She's going to see it. That was Thursday. Friday, I go to school, my last day of school. She comes to me. She's pale. I said, lady, do you have the virus or something, the flu? What's wrong with you? You are yellow. And she says, Pavel, I want you to be honest. I said, I am. Do you know Ceausescu, the president? I said, yep, I see him on the TV every day. She says, no, 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 no. Do you know him personally? You eat together, you talk together, are you buddies? I said, you are crazy. Who can get close to that guy, the president? I said, I don't know him. Do you know anybody in the government, in the inner circle of the president, anybody with power in the government? I said, nope. Be honest. I said, lady, all I know about government, in front of the government building, the palace, it's a whole field of roses. When I don't have money to buy flowers for my wife, I go there and I pick a rose for free. <laughs> That's the government I know. She says, Goya, you don't know what happened today? I said, no. Earthquake? No. What happened today? Well, Ceausescu, the president, spoke at 7.30 a.m. He addressed the country on television, and he said, we need to save the economy. And to do that, starting today, I'm going to close all schools on Saturdays. Starting today, there will be no more schools on Saturday. And she said, if this law came next week, you would be out. And she said to me, there is a God in heaven who loves you. I said, lady, there is a God in heaven who loves you, not me. She says, why do you say that? When I prayed that God would save my school, he didn't answer. When I prayed that God would use my school, that the others would know that he's a God, then he answered. So he loves you more than me. He didn't save my school for my education. He saved my school for you. So you know that there is a God in heaven. And she was big mouth. Wow. You're willing to lose your school so that we know that there is a God? I said, yes. Oh, you are a Christian. Let me ask you. If they would tell you today that you lose your job, or your house, or your bank account, what would you pray for? Huh? If we struggle in small things today, how are we going to make it in big crisis very soon? We cannot be called disciples. Jesus says, unless you are willing to give up everything, the everything means everything. Everything means everything. Unless you are willing to give up everything, you are not my disciple. Think about it. Are you a Christian? Are you willing to give up? Abraham, God said, move. He left and moved. If God says that to you, if God would say to you today, move, would you? God said to Abraham, sacrifice your son. Bang! Would you? Think about it. It's not that God takes your car. As I said last night, God doesn't need to drive. It's not that God took Abraham's son. No, God was not looking for a crime. God was looking for Abraham's commitment. Do you love me more than your son? Eleanor says that he was actually loving his son so much because he was waiting so long, 25 years for a son. And God wanted to show him that the real commitment comes to God first because God gave you the son. You follow me? And God wants you to show him that it's not the sacrifice that you make that is a sacrifice. You think it's a sacrifice, but the real sacrifice is what I do for you. It's not you, Abraham, sacrificing your son. It's me sacrificing my son for you. You follow me? Whatever sacrifice we do for God, it's zero compared to the sacrifice God did for us. And we always look to our sacrifice, what I do for God. I've been an elder, for, I've been a pastor for so many years, I sacrifice so much. You did nothing for God compared to what God has done and what he will do for you. Therefore, stop looking to what you do and start looking to what he does. If you really want to do it joyfully. Unless you are willing to hate everything 
compared to the love for Christ, you are not a Christian. That's the reason Paul says, I consider all things a loss for the price of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I consider how many things? And he says it within one Bible verse, three times I consider all things a loss. And he says, I consider all things and a third time again. And then he says the fourth time, garbage. I consider them garbage. And the word there, actually, for garbage, the word there is not garbage. In Greek translation, is manure, animal residue, manure. I consider my job, my money, my bank account, my life, my health, horse manure, cow manure. I consider them garbage for the price of knowing Jesus. I asked my father one time, what does he mean that you consider your job garbage? And my father said, if you take that garbage and put it in the garden, you are really going to produce nice tomatoes. That's what he said to me. If you take all that you have and put it in Christ's service, imagine the tomatoes. You follow me? All that you are, all that you have, all to Jesus, I serve. Not just song, but practically it is a joy, a privilege. And so, saying that, unless, unless we commit without reservation, we can never experience God's power. Let me move on. He who believes in me, Jesus said, and Jesus doesn't lie, will do greater works than I do. Can you imagine that? Where are those works? Show them to me. Tell me. Tell me. Last week. Give me some examples. Why don't we have those works? Ellen White has pretty clear quotations. And she refers that God cannot give us power because we would use it in a selfish way. And unless we fully surrender and fully commit to the point that God can lead us the way he wants, we will never receive power. And the disciples, after 10 days of prayer in the upper room, when they finally surrendered, they received power. And then she says, their work was accompanied by signs and wonders, she says. They, Peter would walk by and his shadow would touch sick people and the sick people would be healed. Can you imagine that today? If, I, if somebody of you would walk by and just walking by sick people, they would be just, wow, no more back pain. Can you grasp that? Imagine that. Where is that power? They devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer in the upper room. Jesus walks by the Sea of Galilee and he sees them and he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And as he says that, remember something happens. Uh, I, I'm going to give you the story quick. Uh, there are two instances and in, one of, uh, in both of them, Jesus, that was before the cross in the beginning and after the cross again. Jesus says, throw the net in the right side. And they throw the net in the right side. And they catch how many fish? A lot. You remember? Now, I want you to remember exactly. The net was breaking. I want you to remember the beginning of the story. They fished how long? The whole night. And they caught how much fish? Now, I've been fishing with my neighbor. Dan Romun was his name. His, he was a fisherman, his father, his grandfather, from generation to generation. That guy, there were five people fishing, they caught nothing. And he was catching fish after fish. And they said, oh, you, you probably have a good spot. So he said, okay. And they switched. And then he was catching fish there, and they were catching nothing. <laughs> and he would tell me, when he would caught the fish, he says, this is a bass. This is a... I said, how do you know? The way it moves. You know the fish, the way it moves? It's like my father, he would go to the beehives, he would put his ear on the box, and he would say... They don't have a queen, or they don't have food, or they are sick. Or, how do you know? By noise. Come on. You must be a specialist, you know. And this guy was a fisherman. And this guy would tell me, you don't go fishing at 10 a.m. when the sun is up. You go fishing at 4, 5 a.m. You follow me? At 9 a.m. you go home. Fish doesn't bite. You just see them playing. They don't bite. Unless they are small and crazy. Smart fish, big fish don't bite, you know. And so... He told me this, you do what to fish, and you do this, and you do that. And, well, 
Peter was a fisherman. He says, Lord, this is my job. I've been fishing all night. There is no fish. Why would you ask me to throw the net here by the shore in the middle day, the sun is up, in front of my fishermen friends? You embarrass me. They will think that I lost my job, that I, I, I lost my mind. And Jesus says, throw it. And he says, Lord, because you say so, in faith, I'm going to obey. Okay. And he throws the net. And he catches so much fish that he cannot lift it up. The net is breaking. And Peter says, in my imagination, I'm going to sell the fish. I'm going to put this for retirement, this to the church. I'm going to give 20% instead of 10. And this, I'm going to build a new house. And this is reserved for kids' education. And this, you follow me? And Jesus says, leave it all. Follow me. Are you, what's wrong with you? Why would I leave it all? And now the question comes, why did you give it to me? You asked me to throw the net, you gave me the fish. Why would you give it to me if you want me to give it up? You know why? Ellen White says, Jesus gave them the fish to teach them a lesson that if they follow him, he has the power to provide for them. He has the power to provide for you. Why are you afraid to follow him? Think about the other one. There is a guy in the Old Testament. And, and, and Elijah comes by El Elisha. And Elisha is plowing the ground. And he has a nice farm. And poor people didn't have a cow or an ox. And they had to borrow from somebody else. They would bring sacrifice. Not a cow, not a lamb, but a bird because they had no money. And medium class people, they had a pair of oxen. But rich people, they had six pairs or 12 pairs of oxen. They were rich and they had a John Deere tractor and they had all the facilities and the attachments and the plow and the, and the, and the bucket. And they had a whole farm, expensive, big business. This was him, very rich, very well to do. 12 pairs of oxen in that tradition, that meant rich. And Elijah threw the coat on him. In that time, to explain a little, coat meant job. The priest coat would tell everybody that this is a priest. The judge coat was a different coat. Everybody knew you are a judge. The, the, the lawyer coat was different. The pastor coat was a different coat. When you were a prophet, it was a different coat. When he threw the coat on him, he knew it's the call to become a prophet. It's the call to serve God. And he says, let me go back and says, no, 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 listen. And what does he do? Long story short. He sacrificed the oxen and he burned the John Deere tractor. Why would he do that? You could have sold it, sold your business, make good money, and then follow God. Why would he burn the tractor? So there is nothing to look behind ever. No attachments. Don't turn your face back and say, man, what I have lost for God. Burn it all. Don't ever turn around where you came from. Basically, the commitment in those people's lives was absolutely 100%. That's the reason those people had power. Elena White clearly explains, unless we fully commit, we will never experience power. It is not safe for God to give you power if you don't fully commit. Only when you fully Surrender, and God can control you and lead you the way you want. And your will is immersed in God's will. And you don't do what you want, you do what he says. As Jesus, Jesus says, I don't do my own works, but I do the works of the Father. Unless you do that, unless you do that, God cannot give you, will not give you power. After the disciples in the upper room fully surrendered, after that they receive power. Why don't we experience power today? Because we want big miracles with a little surrender. It doesn't work that way. You want miracles, you need to surrender. You want power, you need to give it all up. Everything. I'm not saying that you should give up jobs and homes. Keep your job. Go to work. Work hard. But I am saying that you should love God more than those jobs. I'm saying that you should love God to the point that if God says today, burn it, you should burn it. I am saying that we should be crazy in our love for God to the point that we have no limits in our love for God. I'm not talking about extreme religion, people that are extremists. I am talking about total commitment to God. That type of commitment that would be a joy to die for Christ. 
you will not consider a sacrifice but a privilege. That type of commitment that would be a joy to lose your job for Christ. That type of commitment that you say, there is nothing in this world that I don't joyfully surrender because I love Christ more than. You follow me? Then you receive power. The reason people in that time had... Imagine another, another example. The rich young ruler in slide 11. The rich young ruler. He says, Lord, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a bad question. You don't do to inherit. You belong to inherit. You don't do to, to inherit. Probably we are in the wrong slide. Where he says, sell everything you have and give to the poor. Anyway, so you don't do to inherit. If I do this and I do this and I do this and I do that, I can be in heaven. Whatever you do is not going to save you. You should do. You should keep Sabbath. You should go to church. You should return tithe. You should read the Bible. You should pray. You should know the doctrines. You should know the Bible. You should. But whatever you do doesn't give you the, the credit, the merit to deserve heaven. We are saved by grace through faith. It is Jesus' sacrifice that gives you heaven. And if you really have Jesus in your heart, you are not going to break the commandments. Because if you love me, you keep my commandments, he says in John 14. But the point is this. He says, I've kept all those commandments all my life. Basically, he was a good Adventist. And Jesus says, okay, let's test the practical part. Surrender everything you have and follow me. What did he do? He turned around. If God said to you, let's test you today. Surrender everything. What would you do? And so, saying that, Peter says, Lord, we have given up everything. Jobs and families. What do we get? Listen, when they have given up everything. Peter learns that Tabitha died. Peter goes there, pulls up his best sermon that he has, and keeps a good, nice funeral sermon. And they, they bury her, and everybody goes home. Is that the story? He goes there, and he kicks everybody out of the room. And he says, Tabitha, wake up. And the dead lady comes back to life. Imagine if that happened in this church. One lady died, and you prayed, and the lady came back. Can you grasp what would happen in this area? The church would be flooded. Would you believe that? If she was declared dead, and she was in the morgue, and she was smelling, and they did the autopsy, and she has a death certificate, and you prayed, and she came back to life, can you grasp the news here, and the television, and everybody, and what would happen here? Why doesn't it happen? When Jesus says, you'll do greater things than I did, why doesn't it happen? Can it be that we are not as committed as Peter was? We are not committed as Paul? We are not as committed as Elijah? You follow me? We want miracles, but we don't want surrender. We want to keep something for ourselves and something for God, and we want to have some control. I surrender 95%, that's pretty good. But I keep 5%. I need to have some security. I need to be a little in control. I'm going to jump to the end because our time is up. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I want to jump to slide, I believe it's 17. I don't know if you, we can see, still see it there. Slide 17 or 18, somewhere there. Okay, I can read it for you. Those who don't give up everything cannot be my disciples. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. In the same way, Jesus says, those of you who don't give up everything cannot be my disciples. Let me jump to the end and read you a few quotations before we finish. The first quotation in slide 22 that I gave last night, Seven Testimonies, page 30. To everyone 
who offer himself to God for service, withholding nothing for self, full surrender, is given unlimited heavenly power for the attainment of measureless results. Remember the words, to everyone, to everyone who offers himself to God, not for self, but for service. Not for self. Bless me, heal me, heal me, give me, 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 me. For service, forgetting self, withholding nothing. That's total surrender. Nothing for you. All for Jesus. Unlimited heavenly power, unlimited heavenly power is given for the attainment of measureless results. Grab that. Grasp it and think it. And then if you jump to the next slide, it talks about the disciples. After they surrender, she says that they receive power and they perform miracles and thousands got baptized every day. And then she says, all that the, miracle, the, the disciples did, all church members today should do the same. A work similar to that should happen today. Seven Testimonies, page 33. I want to jump to another slide. Two slides, three slides down. Christ in this life made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans. Christ in this life made no plans for him. He accepted God's plans. And day by day, the Father unfolded the plans to him. So should we that he will deliver us. The Son of Ages 369. Another quotation. Those who depend upon their own wisdom and power separate themselves from God. Listen, folks. I, want you, I don't know if you, if you understand my English. Those who depend upon their own wisdom and power separate themselves from God. Instead of working in union with Christ, they are fulfilling the purpose of the enemy. This are of ages 209. Should we trust our wisdom or we should depend on God's wisdom? We in our society depend very much on our wisdom. Next slide. The reason the professed Christians have no greater power is because they trust too much in their own wisdom and don't give God the opportunity to reveal his power. He will help his children in every emergency if they put their entire confidence in him and obey him. Patriots and Prophets 493. Too many plan for a brilliant future and they fail. Let God plan for you. Wow. If the next slide. Too many. I want to, I want to, I want to jump to this, to this part. God never leads his children. Otherwise, that they would choose to be led if they knew the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose that God has for them. Ministry of Healing 479. The next one. Many who profess to be Christ followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to surrender. They do not make complete surrender because they shrink from the consequences of that surrender. Unless they make this surrender, they can never find peace. The last one. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept this one principle of making the service to God supreme. What is the one principle? Make service to God above yourself, supreme. Those who find perplexity vanish on the plain path before their feet. Ministry of Healing 481. I'm not going to continue. We got to finish. We are late. I'm hungry. We got to finish. It's my privilege to be with you today. We are honest people loving Jesus, loving the church. We all believe in prayer. We all believe in Bible. We all believe in studying. We all believe in service. But we encounter this challenge. It's very hard to fully surrender. We are afraid of what's going to happen to me if I fully surrender. But you need to remember, God loves you more than anything to the point that he gave his son. It would have been easier for God to give you a car than to give Jesus. It would have been easier for God to give you health or to give you a job or a house than to give his son on the cross. But God gave the greatest gift in the universe. He loves us. Therefore, 
God will provide. If you put him first, you may think that you lose. But God will, God will take care of you. You know the song? God will take care of you. He he provided for Elijah. He provided for Israel. Manna from heaven. Water from the rock. God will provide. Don't shrink. Don't be afraid to surrender. It's just Satan put in your mind, what's going to happen to you if you surrender? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding. Try. Get a little out of your comfort zone. Stretch your faith a little. A small experience. Try a little to surrender and see what happens. And you'll see that you don't lose. And as you test the Lord and see how good he is, you'll get strength for a bigger surrender. And as you test him again, you'll get strength. And as you learn to test him and to experience him, you'll develop faith. And uh, you'll grow and learn to fully surrender without any fear. Because only then God can lead you and only then God can pour his power entirely on you. It would not be safe for God to give us power if we don't allow us to lead us because we would use that power in a wrong way. Only when we surrender and he can control us, then God can give us unlimited power. God is calling the church today, you and me, to surrender. And then we'll receive the Holy Spirit. And then we'll finish the work and we'll go home. It's impossible in human power to do that. Our human nature is extremely selfish. Very self-centered. But if you ask God for help and say, Lord, help me today. Without you seeing, the work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't see the wind, but you see the effects. You will not see how God works in you. People call me, I surrendered for a week every day. And I see nothing. I say, well, that's because you look to self. Stop looking to self. Keep your eyes on Jesus. None of your business how he changes you, when he changes you. Your business is to fully surrender. His business is to change you. Do your job and let him do his job. Your job, don't worry how God will change you. He changed the thief on the cross. He can change you. Don't worry about how he does it. You cannot understand God unless you have a brain as big as God's brain. Don't try to understand how God works, how forgiveness works, how salvation works. None of our business. Your business, put Jesus first every day. Fully surrender daily. Commit your life to Jesus daily. Pray daily. Study daily. Make yourself available for service daily. Say, Lord, help me because I cannot do it alone. And he will work through small things that may not seem important to you. And he will use those small things to prepare you for bigger things and bigger. And five years down the road or one year down the road, you look back and you'll say, God has been working. God has been changing. I am not the same. I can see his power in my life. I'm going to share something very strange with you, but, but I should probably not share that. My wife and I made the decision, and I'm going to close with that, I promise. My wife and I made the decision to put God first in all things long ago. And we do fail once in a while, but we get back up right away. Because, you know, the righteous may fall seven times, but he gets up and he keeps walking. And we never look back. We keep looking to the captain of our salvation. And we decided we are going to put God first in everything. Money, job, life, moving, anything, whatever he says. Whatever he says. And always when I pray, I put God first and his church and his work. And I pray for China and I pray for North Korea and I pray for secular countries. I pray for Muslim countries and I go name by name. And then I pray for my coworkers and I pray for my neighbors and I pray for opportunities every day that God would help me. And God gives us opportunities literally almost every day. And then, and then there is nothing wrong to present your needs, to cast all your needs upon him. The problem we have is not that we present our needs, but that we put our needs before God. We put our needs first instead of putting God first. And so I put God first, and then I present my needs. And the problem we also have, when we present our needs, we insist, please give me this, please, 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 please. Instead of give it to God and then say, may your will be done and leave it. Cast your needs upon him is ekbalo. It means to throw Far, like you throw a rock to the point that you cannot take it back. When you cast it upon God, you throw at him and you leave it with him. Now it's his problem, not yours. You trust in him that he will deal with it because he loves you. And so we also present our needs. We didn't have rain for two weeks in Maryland. And we have a beautiful garden. If you see, it's small, but it's, it's six by ten. But it's a beautiful garden. Tomatoes are just big. 
load it and cucumbers and everything, just a beautiful garden. I love gardening. I can talk about gardening another five hours. And I, God gave Adam and Eve a garden. Guess what? Must be important. And those tomatoes from my garden are pfft, Walmart tomatoes, garbage. And so we had no rain. And I was learned, I put you first. And I prayed for this and that and that. But you said that we also can cast our needs upon you. Since we talk about my needs now, would you please give us some rain? And he started to pick, to drop. Tip, 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 tip. I said, thank you, Lord, but this would not make it. I mean, just two drops. It doesn't even water the asphalt. It doesn't, it's, 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 it's too slow. I need heavy rain for my garden. And I heard a voice in my mind saying, close the door of the trailer. I cannot give you heavy rain. The door of the trailer is opened. I said, really? So I went behind the house from the garden and I look and the back gigantic door of the trailer that you can drive a car in the 20 feet long covered trailer was open. My wife was working in the garage. She moved some stuff in the trailer and she forgot it open. So I said, thank you, Lord. I closed the, the door of the trailer. In that moment, it started to pour, breaking for three hours, heavy rain. God cares for his children. We have those experiences almost every day. I could give you story after story after story. We never had them when we focused on self. When we gave up self, ready to die, to lose everything. Job, business, doesn't matter. God started to care for us. We don't have to stress for us. I don't need to fight for myself. He said, I'll go before you. I'll give you gardens that you didn't plant. I'll give you homes that you didn't build. I'll give victory over nations bigger than you. I will fight for you. I'll go ahead of you. You don't have to fight. You'll just go and pick up the spoil. You don't have to stress. I will take care of you. Put me first. Why don't we try to experience that? I am not saying that you will never work and you will have millions. I'm not saying that. We have, uh, my back hurts. I'm struggling. We do have challenges. But when God is with you, you have peace. I'm not a millionaire. In fact, sometimes I live from salary to salary. But I don't have to stress over it. Because I am never alone. When I go through waters, he's with me. When I go through fire, he's with me. He carries me on his palm. He will provide for his loving children. He will give you bread like in sleep. If we put him first, then we will finish the work. Because God has a thousand ways to do things that we know nothing of. And God is calling you and the church to experience total surrender and total dependence. Don't worry about how you'll do it. Just Surrender yourself today and then tomorrow again. And he will do it for you better than you think. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we, we know nothing. You are God. You are infinite. Angels watch you and they all the time sing praises to you because they are amazed. Spiritual prophecy says that if you opened our eyes for one second to see you, we will never doubt you again. Lord, we struggle because we don't know you. We keep our eyes on problems instead of keeping our eyes on you. We struggle because we put self first so many times without even realizing. Though we love you, please help us to know you, help us to trust you, help us to follow you, help us to fully surrender daily. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your spirit. And use us, Lord, for your glory. We all pray in Jesus' name and believe in you and thank you. Amen.